Wasteland, desolate, inhospitable, in unremitting procession. The apparent speed at which you see these pictures is not real time. Only a technical camera was carried on the mission. Altitude about 70 miles, shot with a long lens. This film was taken through an optical sighting instrument on board the spacecraft. Two separate images converge on the single eyepiece. It was intended only for space navigation. Navigation in space requires three dimensions instead of two. Scientific sextant observations made on Apollo 8 were a practical, potentially vital gathering of scientific data. Taking the longer view of the scientific value of the mission, comment was made by Dr. Leo Goldberg, astronomer. I believe the Apollo 8 mission will ultimately prove to be of enormous scientific importance as a vital step that had to be taken before men actually land on the moon. Once they do, the exploration of the moon is bound to give us crucial information on how the moon and other bodies in the solar system were formed. Furthermore, the mission proved that we now have the capability to move large and complicated scientific equipment around in space and to deploy it uh, almost anywhere we wish to in the space between the Earth and the Moon. I find this to be a very thrilling prospect indeed. But no matter what happens in the future, the voyage of Apollo 8 will be looked back upon as the mission that proved we could uh, really operate in space on a large scale. Astronomer Leo Goldberg of Harvard University. The condition of zero gravity, when you get accustomed to it, has some very practical applications. The command module on Apollo 8, serial number 103, did not change at Christmas, but there was talk of reindeer and Santa Claus. Right, uh, he was looking for a chimney on 103 here, but he didn't see any. You could have left the hatch unlocked for him. I'll think about that one. Uh, think real hard, Jim. Ecom says he could have slipped down the steam duct. Sounds good about that time, Bill, it was boiling water.
the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven, and the evening and the morning the second day. And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered in together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called he seas. And God saw that it was good. And from the crew of Apollo 8, we close with good night, Good luck, a Merry Christmas, and God bless all of you, all of you on the good earth. Isaac Asimov is a professor of biochemistry and a prolific writer of science fiction. For many years, he's been thinking in terms of an Earth-to-Moon-to-Earth -to -earth trip. Asimov has a special point of view. The feat of Apollo 8 is of peculiar interest to myself because it places me in the unaccustomed position of being over-conservative. In 1939, I wrote a story describing, in essence, this flight. I placed it in 1973. I suppose if someone had asked me then, do you really suppose people will fly around the moon and back to Earth by 1973, I would have answered, not really, but it makes a good story. Well, they did it in 1968, and I am more happy than I can say. Isaac Asimov stands with one foot in the world of science and one foot in fantasy to take a fictional look at the future and underestimate with both feet in the practical world that now includes outer space, a comment from the returning space capsule during a TV transmission starts us off in another direction. We have you about 180,000. Looking at yourself. Thank you. Well, looking at yourselves as seen from 180,000 miles out in space. Mike, what I uh, keep imagining is if I'm a lonely traveler from another planet, what I think about the Earth from this altitude, whether I think it'd be inhabited or not. Friday, December the 27th, re-entry, splashdown, acquisition, recovery. The last 15 minutes of the flight began at a speed of almost 25,000 miles an hour. Then, only five miles from the appointed rendezvous in the Pacific, it ended speed zero. If a machine may be said to be born when it performs a useful function, perhaps it is said to die when that function is fulfilled. And having died, it will be enshrined next to its still young ancestors, the aircraft of Orville and Wilbur Wright, Lindbergh's Spirit of St. Louis. But this is not an end, far from it. It is part of a much longer plan. It's been estimated that at some time or another during the flight of Apollo 8, over one billion people all over the face of the globe were tuned into the spacecraft by television or radio. The experience was most widely shared.
The astronauts return to the world of men, but there's more. A week to the day after the Apollo 8 splashdown, another Apollo spacecraft had taken up its position on Pad 39 at Cape Kennedy. The countdowns by calendar and clock have begun to bring it to the same moment at which we first saw this Apollo 8 the night before it was born. As launch windows open and close, the next missions move forward. Two test flights of the lunar landing vehicle, and then the proposed landing on the moon. And plans are in the making now, which include flybys of other planets, visits to what Dr. Bunch calls neighbors. Eric Hoffer is a writer, until recently a working longshoreman, whose deep insights into the nature of man have stirred the thinking of many. Let me quote Eric Hoffer's words. I always felt that man is a stranger on this planet, a total stranger. I always played with the fancy that maybe a contagion from outer space was the seed of man. Hence our preoccupation with heaven, with the sky, with the stars, with a god who was somewhere out there in outer space. It's a kind of homing impulse. We are drawn to where we came from. And I'm just tickled to death that this thing is being done by squares you know, by average Americans, not by these pretentious intellectuals, because this is the great genius of the average Americans. They take something momentous and make an unmomentous thing out of it. And by the time they are through with it, traveling into space and to the distant stars will become routine. This is why America is an ambiguity in the world because we make it so that there are no exceptional persons required to do anything.